tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I'm in shock. Like, uh, I still can't believe it. Who killed Jack McIver, the founder of a well-known appliance business found dead at his store also? This is life-saving and life-changing. We need this now. A BC family fights for the province to pay for an expensive but potentially life-changing drug. And... I would love to be able to reason with the city. I, I'm not here to cause trouble. Why the city wants to remove this memorial bench from a Kitsilano park. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Homicide investigators are now probing the death of a well-known South Vancouver business owner. The body of John McIver, who also went by Jack, was found yesterday morning at the store he dedicated his life to. As the CBC's Mickey Cowan reports, it's been difficult news for longtime customers. I'm just in shock. Uh, yeah, I was just talked to him, like, Saturday. Longtime customer Sharon Lee stopped by the South Vancouver Appliance Store this morning. Owner Jack MacGyver had missed an appointment to repair her fridge. And he was always on time. He'd tell you when he's coming and he's there. So today was quite a shock when I kept calling and waiting and he just didn't show up. For more than 50 years, MacGyver owned and operated this appliance sales and repair business. But that long history came to an end yesterday morning. Police say a family member discovered MacGyver inside the business with injuries that led to his death. A company truck was parked out front. Police believe it was a homicide, but are keeping tight-lipped on details. For investigative reasons, we're not going to discuss any potential motive or any details about the cause of death, just to protect the integrity of the investigation. So all those lingering questions, how he died and whether weapons were involved, no word yet. We do know the 78-year-old wasn't known to police. Still, investigators aren't saying whether he was targeted or if gangs or drugs were involved. We're going full tilt to solve this. We need help from the public, anybody who has any information to give us a call. Police haven't made any arrests or released the name of any suspects, but they don't believe people in this neighborhood have any reason to be concerned for their safety. Over the next few weeks, they'll be interviewing witnesses and neighbors trying to figure out exactly how John McIver died. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. Meanwhile, Vancouver police have identified the victim of a shooting that happened late Tuesday evening. 33-year-old Vaughn Bradley Lim was discovered dead from a gunshot wound at an apartment near Main Street and East 35th Avenue. Officers arrested a 30-year-old Vancouver man not far from the scene in connection to the death, but he has since been released from custody. Homicide detectives are asking anyone with information about what happened to give them a call or to contact Crime Stoppers. The driver who hit and killed a Maple Ridge grandmother and then fled the scene has been sentenced to six and a half years in jail. Chilliwack resident Ryan Lowe pleaded guilty to impaired driving causing death and failure to stop at the scene of an accident, among other charges. He hit and killed 48-year-old Laura Jeglum while she was riding her motorcycle with a group of friends on Lougheed Highway two years ago. Two other people were seriously injured. In addition to the jail time, Lowe has been banned from driving for eight years and will be required to submit a DNA sample to authorities. A new Westminster boy with a rare degenerative disease is fighting for access to a potentially life-changing drug. It's one of the most expensive drugs in the world. It's available in four other provinces, but here in B.C., the provincial government is still considering expanding its use. As the CBC's Eric Rankin reports, Miles Ambridge says he can't afford to wait. Okay, you ready? 13-year-old Miles Ambridge weighs just 27 kilos. Disappointingly, though, I was comfortable. Yeah, you're comfortable. Okay, here we go. Miles struggles to maintain his weight. He's slowly becoming trapped in his small body. He says he's fighting two foes, keeping him dependent on his electric okay. wheelchair. Okay. Spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, a rare neuromuscular disease robbing him of his strength, and the BC Health Ministry, which is yet to give him access to one of the world's most expensive drugs, gene therapy that has been proven to halt or even reverse the degenerative disease. What will it be like if I don't get this? And sometimes I imagine it can be pretty bad. His mother is watching Miles deteriorate. 
I mean, it's getting worse, and it's just, it, it's just, and we can't do anything. We just cannot do, our hands are tied. We cannot do anything. This is, you just cannot imagine what it does. They say the solution is Spinraza, according to the U.S. manufacturer's website, a drug that kickstarts production of a protein missing in SMA sufferers. It costs $118,000, a shot, $700,000 for the first year of treatment. So expensive yet so effective, the B.C. government approved it last October, but only for babies with the most severe and fatal form of SMA. Four other provinces appear to have negotiated a discount for Spinraza and fund it much more broadly, providing the drug to sufferers up to 18 years old. B.C. has yet to follow suit. Oh, what can I get you to drink? What do we have? Water. Some water? Okay, hang on. Miles is not getting it because we live in the wrong postal code. BC's health ministry will only say expanded use of the drug for SMA sufferers, such as Miles, is being reviewed. Too slow, says the association fighting for quick action. Now knowing that there's a treatment, but we can't access it, is far more painful than anything we've ever been through. For now, all Miles and his mother can do is wait and hope his steady decline can be stopped if the BC Health Ministry decides to follow the lead of other provinces. It'd be nice if I could walk, but uh, maybe I'll be able to crawl, maybe. But if it's one goal that I just mainly want, it's to just have it stop. Eric Rankin, CBC News, New Westminster. While there will be no overnight SkyTrain service on Fridays and Saturdays, an independent report commissioned by TransLink says the plan wouldn't work. The study finds no safe way to maintain the 30-year-old system if it were to run with longer hours on weekends. Instead, TransLink is expanding its night bus service. Now, there were suggestions of introducing a bus service that would shadow the SkyTrain route, but the mayors want to study that further. I moved an amendment saying we should go for this right away. We should start studying it and, and getting it in place as soon as possible. But unfortunately, uh, you know, I had some support from some mayors like uh, Mayor Buchanan from North Vancouver and Mayor Doug McCallum, but really the rest of the mayors uh, voted against it. I think there was uh, a little bit of conflict amongst the, the mayor's council uh, regarding, uh, you know, I think the, the shadow SkyTrain night bus service versus other, other elements. But I think the reality is we actually need to, to put ourselves in a position to, to be able to do both. Until then, extra trips are being added this fall to the route between Vancouver and Surrey. The N17 night bus to UBC will also be extended to run through the night at the beginning of the fall semester. The mayor of Surrey and a departing member of his coalition are trading barbs today after Brenda Locke became the second city councillor to leave safe Surrey in just a matter of weeks. She follows Stephen Pettigrew, who left the mayor's alliance late last month. Locke says she feels Safe Surrey has become dysfunctional with McCallum at the head, particularly as the city moves toward a municipal police force. He is not inclusive, he is not transparent, and that is problematic. The mayor has taken a my way or the highway approach to uh, City Hall, which is not um, conducive to what we are elected to do. McC McCallum responded today with a statement saying in reference to Councillor Locke, Brenda chose to run with the Safe Surrey Coalition, fully aware of our platform and agenda. She will now have to answer to the tens of thousands of voters she has abandoned. BC and Alberta Premiers standing firm today in their positions on the Trans Mountain expansion. The topic of pipelines has headlined the Western Premiers Conference, which is just wrapping up in Edmonton. Provincial Affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher joins us live now with more. Tanya, how long did it take for the Trans Mountain to come up? Well, not surprisingly, Anita, it was the very first thing the premiers were asked about in their press conference immediately following uh, the meetings today. And the big question was perhaps would John Horgan at the extreme drop the province's reference case? Not so. John Horgan uh, stuck to his stance saying that the province will indeed pursue its reference case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, but he did say, though, we've seen in recent months a gradual shift in his target away from Alberta and instead onto Ottawa. And we did see that again reflected at this conference today. 
we'll continue with the reference case. I had suggested to former Premier Notley, as well as uh, Premier, Prime Minister Trudeau, a year ago that we should go directly to the Supreme Court and it would be over now. But they refused to join me in that case, so we've had to go through the appeal Actually, court. Actually, and I agreed and now, with the Premier Horgan on that too. So we, we could have gone, we could have done this a year ago. Now, all eyes were on the dynamic between the two leaders, and you saw a glimpse of their interaction right there. There's been strong rhetoric from both of them leading up to today's meeting, especially with Jason Kenney passing Alberta's uh, turn off the taps legislation. But judging by their rapport in this uh, post conference, uh, post meeting press conference, uh, well, you can judge for yourselves that it appears to be there on nothing but friendly terms. I wore a blue suit so I could blend in. <laughs> uh, I believe we've uh, begun. Uh, a productive, professional, and respectful relationship uh, so we can discuss these issues uh, and uh, with a clear understanding of our, our mutual goals. Well, the four premiers and the three uh, leaders from the territories also discussed uh, interprovincial trade and climate change as well. Anita, Mike? All right, thanks very much, Tanya. Meanwhile, Trans Mountain's president says he feels good about the pipeline's legal status moving forward. Ian Anderson's confidence comes from having witnessed discussions with Indigenous communities following the second round of consultations. The effort and the time and the energy put into those discussions with Indigenous communities along the right-of-way and, and uh, in proximity were um, a tremendously um, a proud moment really for me to see the, the kind of commitment these individuals had to learn and listen and and provide you know accommodation suggestions back to the communities to to uh, address their concerns. Still no active construction on the project. Trans Mountain is still waiting on the necessary approvals from the National Energy Board. The expectation is that will begin in early to mid September. Anderson says they're also cooperating with the community of Coldwater to find the right route that meets both parties' needs. Two men have been arrested by Chilean police in connection with the mugging and killing of a former UBC professor. Two people tried to snatch Peter Winterburn's backpack while he was walking with his family in the town of Valparaiso, Chile. He tried to stop them and was stabbed to death. His wife and daughter were unharmed. Local media say the suspects will be in court on Wednesday. A BC couple has lost everything they own after their moving truck was stolen from a hotel parking lot in Abbotsford. Police say there was more than $100,000 worth of belongings inside, plus all of the sentimental value. The truck was likely stolen late Friday and found empty in Surrey Saturday morning. You can find more details on our website, and if you have any information, you are asked to contact Abbotsford Police. And another theft now, Richmond RCMP hoping you can help identify a suspect involved in snatching a purse from a woman in her 90s earlier this month. It happened June 17th in a parking lot on Number 3 Road between Bennett and Granville. The suspected snatcher is described as a white man in his late teens or early 20s with a thin build. He was wearing a black ball cap with a black hoodie, shorts and running shoes. Anyone with information is asked to call police. A litter of week-old kittens is looking for a home after being found abandoned, overheated, but alive in a box on a Maple Ridge Road. The newborn cats were picked up off the median of 113B Avenue near Airport Way, but only because a passenger, a passing train rather, prompted their rescuer to turn off his car, allowing him to hear their cries. They were treated for fleas and will be ready for adoption by September. A Vancouver woman wanted to give her late partner's memorial bench at Kitts Beach a colorful makeover, so she painted it. She and others thought it was a tasteful improvement, but as Andrea Ross reports, the city says it has to go. I would love to be able to reason with the city. I am not here to cause trouble. Julia Goodkova thought painting this memorial bench would be a great way to celebrate her late partner's memory. Colin McKay's name has been on it since he died in a motorcycle crash. The bench, since it's been here for four years, it's been looking quite gray and weathered, and uh, the city doesn't really uh, wash them or take care of them very much, so I kind of took it into my own hands to create something beautiful. Goodkova spent days sanding, priming, and painting it. But before the paint had even dried, the city told her it had to go. Painting park benches is not allowed, 
And Gudkova was told this one doesn't blend in with the others here. I pleaded with them to keep the bench up uh, until July 2nd, which is coming up in just a short few days. Uh, we're going to have a memorial um, uh, gathering and ceremony for all the friends and family and community on that day. And, and I really wanted to, to have the bench for that day. Today, the city agreed not to remove the bench until after the memorial. Welcome news for Gudkova and the passers-by who have enjoyed seeing it this week. Some who'd hate to see it go. I think city, city is very, they have very bad taste. They are tasteless. They don't know. This is, this is going to add a lot to the beauty of the city and, you know, people will enjoy this. Everyone who is passing this bench is going to look at it and enjoy it. Gudkova says she never meant to cause any trouble. But until this bench is removed, she's going to enjoy it. I want to spend as much time as I can at the bench, particularly if it's if it's going to be removed. She's hoping this is the start of a new conversation with the city about public art. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, for the first time in a long time, there is hope for an historic Vancouver district that has, in recent years, fallen on hard times. A celebration at Vancouver City Hall took place today to recognize the passing of a motion to revitalize the Punjabi Market District. The area which once thrived with clothing shops, grocers and restaurants has been suffering in recent years with the increase in cost of living. But with the 50th anniversary of the neighborhood next year, the city is looking to change that. We want to build these sort of complete communities so that South Asian people have a, a place, they don't have to go to Surrey to shop for a sari or get some great lassi or anything like that, they can actually do it here in Vancouver. A new generation of South Asian Canadians is hopeful the revitalization project won't just preserve the past, but also open up the market to create a more vibrant future. We're not just some gang members and criminals from Surrey that just are here for some reason and are, are going to mess up Vancouver. So I really hope that that celebration for 50 years brings that awareness and brings people to just want to be to just be interested in seeing what Vancouver has to offer in terms of racial diversity. The market, located along Main Street between 48th and 51st, turns 50 on May 31st, 2020. Speaking of markets, there's one going on right behind you there, Brett. <laughs> You've got it right. I'm outside right now, just out of our studios here. But that is our downtown market. It happens every Thursday into the afternoons. And I haven't been able to check it out just yet, but it looks like they've got some delicious things for sale. That said, I'm out here now, and this is probably the coldest it's been that I can remember in a couple of months at least. And the temperatures certainly would explain that. We've got temperatures into the mid-teens widespread across the region. We had a lot of rain. But in addition to that, I wanted to show you, we had a lot of lightning still across the province yesterday, as I mentioned. This was a big concern province-wide and especially toward the north. I was able to do the math and look into it and it looks like actually 13 new wildfires were ignited yesterday because of this lightning across the province and we don't know about the stats for today but certainly there is still a lot of thunderstorm activity that is going on. On that note, I wanted to show you one area of interest right now in particular on your screen there. You're seeing some severe, severe thunderstorm watches and warnings for the interior of BC. That's a watch for the Kelowna area and just new, just outside of a soy around Grand Forks. That's where we actually have a severe thunderstorm warning at this point in time. So I'm watching it quite closely. On the radar here, you're going to see that we have a lot of these discrete cells, as they're called, little packets of energy, bringing a lot of heavy rain and potentially some hail to the regions. So that is a primary concern. Uh, but of course, these aren't expected to be lasting for too, too much longer. So over the next couple of hours, expect these unsettled conditions to continue. And aside from that, temperatures in the region right now, as I mentioned, we're looking at around 17 in West Van, 19 downtown, which is still pretty close to seasonal, but it's going to be warming up just in time for the long weekend. Thanks very much, Brett. You're welcome. Well, the weather may be unpredictable at times, but the places that you can watch us won't be ever be, really. Yes, download the free CBC Gem mobile app. To watch this newscast wherever you go, we're also on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just look for CBC Vancouver. It is the longest race of its kind and draws an international field of competitors coming up, paddling for top prizes in Canada's north. Okay, Canada's icebergs are majestic and they are also melting. Scientists are now trying to put a time frame on just how quickly the icebergs are melting and what will happen to the waters left behind.
in our ongoing climate change series. Chris O'Neill Yates looks at what could lie ahead for coastal communities. The arrival of icebergs ushers in spring and tourists. So like the tourism is a great boost to Newfoundland, right, to, to all the little outports and, and the city too. When this unusual chunk of ice broke off, it rubbed against a valley and took part of Greenland with it. Icebergs always came over the years, so like, you know, like it makes you wonder, you know, like, it, will they ever stop? That's what Memorial University glaciologist Lev Tarasov is trying to figure out. We'll keep seeing them, but there'll be less of them. By the end of the century, we're going to have less icebergs coming from Greenland. Tarasov is the sole Canadian on an international team of scientists, estimating a time frame in which these changes could happen. From boring down into the layers of icebergs, it's clear that from the mid-1900s to the turn of the century, there was no change in melt patterns. Then... Around the turn of the century, we started seeing much bigger. We started seeing clear changes. Right now, when chunks calve off the Greenland glacier, they fall into the ocean and become icebergs. But when the glacier retreats from the sea and onto land, those ice chunks will end up melting on land. All they can do is melt. They can't form icebergs anymore because they're not in the water. All this melt is directly tied to rising sea levels globally. And that's something else this research is hoping to predict. A time frame for how much sea levels will rise and by when. The flood levels have, have been rising. But that's of crucial interest development. for Joe Dario. We have a lot of coastal towns in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Dario is training engineers with the provincial government to incorporate climate change into how they design public infrastructure. So knowing when something might happen is a bonus for planning purposes. How do we design uh, a bridge crossing, a culvert, to carry the largest possible flow? If we have a design life, 50 years, 50 years the climate's going to be very, very different. The, the likelihood of the extreme event or the high flood can be very different. Some of this ice took 100,000 years to form. Because of climate change, experts say, within our children's lifetimes, it could disappear entirely. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Bonavista, Newfoundland. They really are quite spectacular yeah, to look yeah. at. I imagine in person, for sure. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen one in person, just on TV, but wow. Better get a good look at them soon because... Before they uh, all disappear. Hopefully that's not going to happen. Hopefully but. not, yeah. Okay, we're going to have a look at uh, BC's newest Coast Guard ship in just a few minutes. Stay with us. can overstate the importance of this milestone. That's Minister of Fisheries and Oceans Jonathan Wilkinson moments after officially inaugurating the new CCGS Sir John Franklin vessel. It'll be joining the Canadian Coast Guard fleet and based out of the Institute of Ocean Sciences on Patricia Bay near Victoria. The federal government says the Coast Guard plays a vital role in developing marine science. They work hand in hand with fisheries and oceans with researchers in the department as they conduct critically important work to improve our knowledge base on marine ecosystems, the health of fish stocks, and to inform what evidence-based government policy needs to look like to best protect our ocean environment. The ship is the first of three offshore fisheries science vessels being built in British Columbia. And that ship isn't the only thing hitting the water today. An epic paddling race is underway in Canada's north. The Yukon River Quest covers more than 700 kilometres from Whitehorse to Dawson City. That's the longest race of its kind and draws an international field of competitors. The CBC's Philippe Morin was there for the launch. Paddlers have come to Yukon from 13 countries and from across Canada. For the Yukon River Quest, it's a record-breaking year. This team drove to Whitehorse from Saskatchewan with their canoes in tow. When they cross that finish line, I'll be very, very happy. Not just us, but our community back home too. So. For some, it's a competitive race. This team has won twice, making it 715 kilometers to Dawson City in just over two days. We have number one on our boat this year, but we also have a big target on our back, and other people want to take that number away from us. 
For many, the Yukon River Quest is more than just a sport. People take part to remember those they've lost. They raise money for important causes, and they find strength, friendship, and support. We're part of the team Paddlers Abreast. Paddlers Abreast is a um, boat of breast cancer survivors and supporters. And this year we are super excited to be part of the race and um, showing survivors of cancer that there is life after cancer. The race begins at noon with a dash to the riverside, and then they're off. Some alone, some together. Being amongst these people, these women of Paddler's Arrest has been honestly the biggest, biggest moment in the healing journey from cancer. Just being around strong women who have been through something who so intimately understand. It's okay. Oh, it's, uh, it has been life changing, life changing. Can I say something? Yes, of course. What would you like? I am extremely proud of my, of my mom and her team. Me too. I'm extremely proud of you guys. Love you. It's not just canoes that go towards Dawson City. The race also includes kayaks and stand-up paddle boards. And you need really strong legs to stand all that way. The fastest teams should arrive in Dawson City by Friday. Teams taking part this year come from as far away as Australia and New Zealand. Some will be racing non-stop, not stopping the canoes to sleep or even stopping to prepare meals. The kilometers, the hours and the exhaustion are enough to test anyone's mettle. Philippe Morin, CBC News, Whitehorse. A growing number of young people are seeking help for their mental health in hospital emergency rooms. A look at why and what needs to be done coming up.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. He was always on time. He'd tell you when he's coming and he's there. So today was quite a shock when I kept calling and waiting and he just didn't show up. The death of the founder of a well-known appliances business is now being called a homicide. The body of 78-year-old Jack McIver was found at his store yesterday morning. What will it be like if I don't get this? And sometimes I imagine it can be pretty bad. 13-year-old Miles Ambridge is fighting for BC to fund an expensive but potentially life-changing drug. Four other provinces do cover the cost. The city said they will remove the bench because it's been painted and they basically said they qualify it as tagging, um, as graffiti and vandalism. Julia Goodkova thought painting her late partner's memorial bench in a Kitts Park was a great way to celebrate his memory. She hopes the city will reconsider its decision to take it away. A growing number of young people are seeking help for their mental health in hospital emergency rooms. According to a new study in Ontario, visits spiked 78% between 2003 and 2017. Doctors are seeing more severe cases too. Health reporter Christine Birak looks at why and what more needs to be done. Emergency rooms have seen a surge over the last decade in young patients suffering from mental health problems, ranging from anxiety and depression to self-harm. Our emergency department physicians, our crisis intervention workers, and our psychiatry staff are all observing an increase. A recent Ontario study found the number of young people visiting emergency for self-harm has more than doubled, from nearly two kids in every thousand a decade ago to more than four per thousand in 2017. I'm hearing a lot about academic stress and pressure. That's one big thing. The other big theme falls under the general category of relationships. I came out of a mental hospital for depression and they're like, no, you're just lazy. Hanging out Everyone in this group together, has lived with mental illness, in including psychosis that nearly cost some of them their lives. I don't think that there's more mental illness than there has been in the past. He's right. The overall prevalence of mental disorders in kids remains between 10 and 20 percent. So what's changed? They all agree the good news is there's less stigma and more kids are seeking help. But the bad news is they're now staring at a lot of screens, which can be isolating. You see a lot of people just on their cell phones, almost like a lack of communication that I noticed. Despite investments in mental health services, they also feel the system isn't well coordinated. I feel that we need more preventative measures. We shouldn't be having to go to the ER. We should be addressing this early on. One of the challenges for mental health um, nationally is what we call access and equity. So accessing mental health services in a timely way. This psychiatrist agrees the mental health system still has huge gaps and too much screen time is pushing kids towards unhealthy habits. If they're spending that amount of time on smartphones, they are spending less time with direct communication with their friends uh, and less time, um, as I say, exercising or sleeping, which is what they should be doing. Crimes committed by the mind disease Gotta break the stigma and the fallacies Cut. A support program at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health brought this group together. Mentally healthy, gotta be mentally healthy, it's about recovery. Music mentally offered them a sense healthy. of belonging. Can we do a hug? Oh. Giving them a chance to bring their darkest days into the light. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. At 6.34 on this Thursday evening, a live look at the beautiful towers at Metro Town. The long weekend is almost here. Brett's forecast is next.
extreme heat is covering Europe. In parts of France, temperatures are climbing close to 40 degrees Celsius. But some people are still managing to make light of the situation. This is the weather map of France for today. Take a look at the center. It may look kind of familiar. At least one French meteorologist thought so, comparing that ominous face to the famous painting The Scream by Norwegian artist Edvard Munch. Perhaps an apt metaphor for their forecast. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it is pretty good. That, that yeah. was Very pretty similar. uncanny. And honestly, if you looked at the temperatures in the forecast for parts of southern France, I think I would be making that <laughs> face, face well. too. Yeah. Like 42 it's degrees. Amazing. That's just, that is not yeah. comfortable for anyone. No. On the other end of the spectrum, though, we had a lot of rain. It happened. I'm actually really happy about that because it had some good news for all of us. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But I wanted to show you what it actually looked like on our webcam here. Prepare yourself for it. There's a lot of clouds. And then just like that, there comes the rain. It definitely woke me up. I don't know about you guys, but I was facing in the southeast direction and it definitely battered my window like that. But honestly, I was happy for it. I was so happy to see that that was the case. But you may be wondering, so how much rain actually did fall? These are unofficial totals for you, but I wanted to show you why VR, that's our airport, that's 16.2 millimeters. But if you're listening in from West Van, you may be like, hey, I got way more. Yeah, you got 31.6 millimeters. That's quite a lot. And even Victoria actually set a record for the greatest one day precipitation since February. That was back when they got 26 centimeters of snow. Can you believe it? Now, this had a huge impact on our fire danger rating, and I wanted to really zoom in on this and show you what it looks like. This is what it was from the 26th. This was yesterday. Remember how it was quite high down toward the south coast? Well, check out what it is now. That's amazing, isn't it? The blue in the southern interior there is now indicating very low. And once again, from yesterday, you can see it quite high, even in the south coast of Vancouver Island. And then that in itself has improved. So it is incredible what a little bit of rain, or in this case, a fair amount of rain, can actually do. That same time, we're going to be looking at just a little bit more rain to end the week for us. It's not going to be a lot by comparison to yesterday. Looking at Friday morning, specifically anywhere around Coquitlam, Maple Ridge, Abbotsford Mission, and Chilliwack, probably some light showers as early as 6 o'clock. Then throughout the day, just expect a few clouds. It's not going to be all that sunny, but at the same time, we shouldn't be seeing any more significant rainfall in that time. That said, for what we did actually get and what is to come, this is still going to be helping our fire danger rating across the whole region. And it's not just us. It's going to be all the way across Vancouver Island as well. But hey, you know what? The long weekend is just around the corner. Canada Day is coming up. We are probably really looking forward to that. So I wanted to show you what we are expecting throughout this time. As I mentioned, Friday, a little showery, a little bit cooler, but look, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I'm feeling pretty good about this. I've got to be honest, I know Anita yesterday kind of poked a bit of fun at me for not having a lot of confidence in this weekend's forecast, but uh, it's rising. I would say that we're looking at a pretty stellar weekend, all things good. considered. And you're confident in that I now? I think. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet some money on it this time. Okay. Own it. Yeah, just own yeah, it. I'm going to own it. On. It's going to be great. <laughs> Happy long weekend to everyone. Awesome. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, okay. It's uh, safe to say Toronto is still kind of in the grip of basketball fever after the Raptors' NBA championship victory earlier this month. Which is why a video showing a city worker taking down the rims at a local park, as they usually do at the end of the day, got quite the reaction. Oh yeah, and as the CBC's Greg Ross explains, the video was enough to make the mayor himself step in. And he said, sorry fellas, like right as the clock hits six, I gotta take the rim down. That's when Mitch Robson grabbed his phone and started recording. He captured this video of a city worker removing the rim from the backboard. He then posted it on social media, unaware of just how much attention it was going to get. I just threw at City of Toronto in the initial tweet just to see if it could get some eyeballs and maybe something would happen. And, then, and it did. Yeah, and then it did. Um, as the night progressed on, Tory replied to my tweet and then quote tweeted it, sent it out. The mayor then followed that up with this today. I personally requested that the staff stop doing that. We're now going to go back and find out the answer to the question as to how many places uh, in which this was happening. The mayor says city staff were removing rims at parks where residents in the area had complained about noise, a policy that got this reaction from Raptors president Masai Ujiri when asked about it earlier this week. There's been complaints about um, noise from basketballs. Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> My first reaction is anywhere there's a basketball court is a good thing. While the mayor says he respects residents' desire for peace and quiet, he says it's important to balance that with the necessity to provide kids with a safe place to play sports. 
Uh, I opt in favor of positive, fun, healthy activities for kids uh, in these neighborhoods, supported by the city leaving nets in place and, in fact, putting up more. The mayor says the compromise is keeping courts open as long as there's daylight, which means residents near basketball courts can still get peace and quiet after dark. Robson says he can live with that. The mayor says that kids should be able to play as long as there's daylight. Is that a good compromise? I think so, yeah. I mean, if you want to take them down at 10, 11 o'clock so you don't want people congregating at night, totally, that makes sense. And it's not just the city that's making sure that these rims stay in place. The Toronto District School Board has also received similar noise complaints about their basketball courts. Well, today, they announced that they're going to be keeping all of their rims in place as well. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. It's a mega deal that merges Canada's biggest airline with the third largest carrier in the country. What it all means for passengers, coming up. Yeah, it's really relevant here in Metro Vancouver. I'm calling from CBC Vancouver News. There are so many stories in this city to tell and to explore. Are you available for an interview? Our listeners deserve an explanation. This. That's just anecdotal. It's really the perfect place to live. The fact that people come from all over and want to make a home here, that says a lot about the city. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver's Dan Burrett will host the third annual Canada Day drumming celebration at Creekside Park on July 1st. And don't miss the Indian Summer Festival, July 4th to 14th. This year's provocative lineup features futurists, novelists, stand up comedians, musicians, and storytellers from around the world. For more on these events, check us out online. After a month of negotiating, Montreal-based travel company Transat AT has accepted a $520 million takeover offer from Air Canada. The deal merges Canada's biggest airline with the third largest carrier in our country. Alison Northcott now on what it means for passengers. 
Air Canada and Air Transat say their agreement is good for travellers, employees and shareholders. The airlines say Air Transat would keep its separate brand and its own Montreal head office. But details about prices, available flights and jobs are scarce. Air Canada's CEO foresees increased job security for both companies' employees through greater growth prospects. Air Transat says its customers will have more choices and possibilities. But one consumer advocate sees a less rosy picture. This is bad news for consumers, for uh, passengers. We are concerned about the monopolistic effect on the market. We have very few airlines. Each of them control a very large chunk of the market. This is making that situation worse. Still, with WestJet recently sold to Onyx, some analysts say consumers could benefit from increased competition between the two carriers, just don't count on lower prices. Air Canada is going to need to get the costs of this acquisition somehow. They're going to have more pricing power. Let me put it this way, as a consumer, I wouldn't be expecting a price reduction. It is possible, but it's really going to be done, if anything, in response to any actions by WestJet. For travellers at Pearson Airport today, one question was top of mind. Right, does that limit options as far as sales go? If they control both, does that mean that transact flight prices will start to creep up again? As long as the fares doesn't go up, because they can, their fares are way up there. The airline went ahead with the agreement even with other offers on the table, including one worth a dollar more per share. Considering that our offer is still outstanding at $14, uh, I think they're going to have some challenges to... Uh, to get their shareholders to approve that uh, the deal they signed. The agreement still has to be reviewed by the Competition Bureau and approved by Air Transat shareholders, some of whom say the company is worth more than what Air Canada has offered. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. China has banned all Canadian meat after finding fake Canadian inspection certificates on an imported pork product. Experts say it looks like food fraud, scammers trading on Canada's reputation for their own profit. And as Mike Crawley tells us, it's an industry worth billions around the globe. What do Canadian pigs have in common with Gucci handbags? Both are targets of counterfeiters. Canadian meat is highly valued across Asia, and that makes a Canadian meat inspection certificate valuable too. Fake certificates allow shady businesses to fetch a higher price to their phony products. Food fraud is a global problem. It's estimated about $49 billion worldwide, and we have organized crime that are at the, uh, at the core of this. This expert just spent six years working in Asia as a food supply chain consultant. He believes the contaminated pork shipment that triggered China to ban imports of all Canadian meat likely originated in China. Could it have been a fake product from a local source? Um, it's highly unlikely that it came from Canada. We want to understand where this uh, pork originated from, who's involved, uh, as so that we can move forward and frankly uh, continue and regain market access into, uh, into China. To find out, Canadian officials need to get their hands on a sample of the meat from the contaminated shipment. Chinese officials say it was treated with ractopamine, an additive that nearly all Canadian pork farmers stopped using six years ago. A DNA test of the meat could prove its geographical origins. And it could be from any, anywhere else, and it is really the investigation who will tell us um, where this meat comes from. The RCMP's Sensitive and International Investigations Branch is handling the case. It's the arm of the Mounties that also deals with corruption and cybersecurity. And that gives you a sense of how challenging it could be to track down the origins of this food fraud. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Trade issues like that one are going to be front and centre at the G20 summit about to kick off in Japan, as will talks between China and the U.S. As Evan Dyer explains, when those countries' leaders get together, the whole world is going to be watching, especially Canada. One of the most anticipated events at this Group of 20 summit is going to be the bilateral meeting between President Xi of China and President Donald Trump. We're expecting that to take place on Saturday, and we're hearing early reports that there may be some kind of a breakthrough or at least a truce in the tariff war between those two countries. This would take the form of a delay or an extension in the imposition of the second wave of U.S. tariffs that Donald Trump has threatened against China. This affects about $30 billion of Chinese imports that so far have not had to face U.S. tariffs. It is all uh, Chinese imports that are at stake in the, under this tariff threat here. 
Uh, if a delay were to be achieved, though, it would be far from a final resolution. In fact, it would be a very similar situation to the one we saw at the Group of 20 summit last year in Argentina, where the two agreed to a delay of 90 days. Uh, but at the end of those 90 days, tariffs were indeed imposed. And we also saw the two sides giving somewhat different interpretations of the truce, the agreement that they had reached. So uh, you can count on other countries parsing very closely any statement that comes out of this uh, trump Xi meeting, because this is a trading relationship that affects the whole world. Other countries, of course, pretty much spectators in that bilateral arrangement, uh, but Canada more perhaps than others, because Canada has a second issue uh, that is very important in that Xi-Trump summit, and that's the question of whether President Trump will follow through on his promise to raise the issue of two Canadian detainees held by China, as he told Justin Trudeau in the Oval Office about a week ago. Canadian officials say they are optimistic that he will raise the issue, less optimistic that that will lead to an immediate breakthrough uh, lacking some kind of a grand bargain in the trade war between the U.S. and China and a resolution of the Meng Wanzhou case. Uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau this morning is going to meet with one of the countries that has benefited from the U.S.-China trade war, and that's Vietnam, which has seen its imports to the U.S. spike dramatically, even as Chinese imports have gone down as a result of tariffs. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Osaka. Well, it's not your typical training exercise for the Canadian Armed Forces. Coming up, how Bhangra is used to celebrate inclusion in the military. Friday on the early edition, our workplace columnist enjoys a good laugh as much as anyone else, but she's careful about how she does it on the job. We'll talk about the upside and downside of humor at work. To breaking news now, and just moments ago, the inquest into the death of a 16-year-old who died of a drug overdose, came back with a number of recommendations. 
All of them are in hopes a tragic story like the Victoria teens is never repeated. Our Dan Burrett has been following this story for us. And Dan, what are some of the recommendations into Elliot Urchuk's death? They are centered around health care and treatment. There are seven of them. In fact, the coroner just released them. Here are three main ones. First of all, the jury recommends they develop processes for early detection of mental health and substance use disorders within schools. That's for the education minister. Two, they want to build a plan to move youth from health care facilities back to community-based services. That's for the health minister. And lastly, and also for the health minister, they want to provide youth with more long-term residential substance use disorder treatments in facilities, and particularly on Vancouver Island, because that's where Elliot Urchuk died. He was an athletic boy who was prescribed opioids after he had several surgeries. His parents say they requested alternative medicines and access to his medical records when he showed signs of addiction, but they claim they were denied any input into his prescriptions because the medical system found their son was old enough to manage his needs. Urchuk's parents say the recommendations are good, but they would like to see more specifics. One thing that Brock and I were really hoping to have some comment to in the recommendations would be around secure care um, for individuals who have severe substance use um, disorders. Now Brock Urchuk, Elliot's father, says they orchestrated having him committed to VGH under the Mental Health Act so they could have more time to figure out how to handle what he calls Elliot's dependence on opioids. But Urchuk argues he would have gotten better treatment at a dog kennel. And the inquest lasted eight days and had heard from more than 40 witnesses. Anita, Mike? Dan, thank you. Well, it is National Multiculturalism Day, and what better way to celebrate than with a little bit of song and dance? Pick up your left leg up like this and bring it back. Up and back. Oi, chakka chakka la, chakka chakka la, chakka day. Not your typical training exercise for the <laughs> Canadian Armed Forces members of the military and navy collaborated with Punjabi artist Gurdi Pandare. He taught them Bhangra for a dance video to celebrate diversity and inclusion in the military. The video was shot at CFB Esquimalt, featuring soldiers from different backgrounds. They're pretty good. They are very, good. very good. We should get you in there, Why teach not? you a few Pogoda moves. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, with the Canada Day long weekend just ahead of us, a lot of people are gonna be firing up the barbecue to cook a summertime favorite hot dogs. Today we're going for the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest hot dog in the world. It's unlikely any backyard chef <laughs> is going to match this. Wow. 30 kilograms and one and a half meters long. Wow. It was created by Fellmans of Coney Island, the company that claims to have invented the hot dog 152 years ago. It'll be a few months before we find out if this titanic tube steak wins a spot in the Guinness Book of Records. Wow. Okay, we saw what they put on it. What do you put on it? Ketchup, mustard, onion relish. Mm. Yeah, the ketchup thing. Uh, what? Sauerkraut, great Who idea. Who are you? I love the sauerkraut. All right, you can always eat hot dogs, and you can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. I guess I won't be coming to your house for a barbecue <laughs> if you're not gonna have ketchup. <laughs> we'll let you have ketchup. Dan is back here at 11 o'clock after the National. Good night.